Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, Michael, for that very inspirational film. And thank the Holy Father for his leadership in this area of nonviolence. I'm honored to join each of you today for this inaugural Christmas retreat on gospel nonviolence. And I bring you greetings from the King Center, the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change, which uh, was founded by my mother, uh, Ms. Coretta Scott King in 1968 as the official living memorial to the life, work, and legacy of my father. Um, at the King Center, we are daily engaged in the work of educating and training people in my father's nonviolent philosophy and methodology of nonviolence, which we call Nonviolence 365, because we believe it is a way of life that can truly lead to a more just, humane, peaceful, equitable world, which is ultimately the beloved community. In my father's 1964 nonviolence, excuse me, Nobel Peace Prize lecture, he stated, I suggest that the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence become immediately a subject for study in every field of human conflict, uh, by no means excluding conflict between nations. Being at the helm of leadership in one of the most turbulent times in the history of the United States of America, he well understood the intransigent forces of evil that marginalized and oppressed people faced. The level of violence, brutality, and terrorism that the African-American community faced in the 1950s and 1960s required a force more powerful than all the police, militaristic, and political powers that were used against African-Americans to keep them subjugated to inferior status. For African-Americans under my father's leadership, nonviolence emerged as the weapon of choice to resist these evils because it aligned uh, with the teachings of Jesus Christ on how to deal with your enemies and those that would seek to destroy you and create policies and laws that limit your freedom and deny your equality. Nonviolence gave them a means to wage war against these evils without relying upon arms or weapons, but relying upon agape love as a driving force to resist cooperating with institutional customs and laws that were steeped in discrimination and enslavement. Agape love is lived and taught, of course, by Jesus Christ, and modeled by my father and so many others, fueled nonviolence and gave those who embraced it the power to endure suffering for a cause without inflicting it on others because the ultimate goal was not just to defeat the evil and injustice, but to win the opponent or adversary's friendship and understanding, thereby making way for the creation of the beloved community. That, in my opinion, is the true power of nonviolence that transcends time which is the, its ability to create and keep cohesion within humanity because of its insistence on maintaining respect for the dignity and worth of the human personhood while pursuing justice and freedom. As my father said, nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon, unique in history, which cuts without wounding and ennobles the person who wields it. Because the New Testament scriptures teach us that it is the will of the Father that none perish, but that every person come to repentance. As followers of Christ, we are compelled to follow the way of nonviolence, even when faced with evil, injustice, or oppression, so that we can reflect the true heart and posture of God and leave room for those who would inflict the injustice, evil, or oppression to be transformed in their thinking. The power of nonviolence is its ability to resist evil and injustice with a discipline and a dignity to destroy the evil and injustice and yet refuse to defeat or destroy people, but expose the ugliness of the injustice or evil to those that perpetuate it for the express purpose of arousing their conscience in a way that leads to a sense of contrition in their heart. In our time, there are those who reject the authentic way of nonviolence, 
because they have failed to truly study it, as my father suggested, and experiment with it. They have merely ascribed it to, uh, to, to it, in, they have merely uh, embraced it in a tactical way through spontaneous, peaceful protests and demonstrations in response to societal ills, such as racially motivated police killings, economic oppression and exploitation, political suppression, or environmental injustice. While these protests may have succeeded at dramatizing the evil of injustice of wrongdoing or wrongdoing, so as to wait, awaken a contingent of the indifferent, the silent, and the complacent, they have fallen short in their ability to sustain momentum that will lead to permanent social change. The power of authentic nonviolence lies in its adherence, understanding it is not merely a tactic, but truly a way of life that is strategic, disciplined, and I dare say committed as, and to the ultimate goal of creating the beloved community by eliminating what my father called the triple evils of poverty or extreme materialism, racism, and militarism. Throughout the vast sweep of human history, these triple evils have been the major obstacles to a just, humane, and equitable world society. Never have the people of the world been able to live in peace and harmony for any extended period of time. Finding and the end to these triple evils is an enduring challenge which has bewildered scholars and philosophers and theologians and educators and presidents, politicians and leaders in general down through the ages. The nagging persistence of evil has been the topic of philosophical inquiry and religious speculation since the dawn of humankind. In that Nobel Prize lecture, acceptance lecture, my father also reminds us that our survival as humanity depends on our ability to solve the problems that occur as a result of these evils. These evils are still the most threatening problems we face as a world community. If we're to survive and conquer them, uh, the, these evils that threaten humanity, then we cannot escape the truth of my father's words when he said that nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral questions of our time. The need for man to, to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to oppression and violence. Man must evolve, he went on to say, for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. Therefore, to eradicate these evils requires a sustained plan of action that combines strategy, discipline, organization, as Michael said, look courage, agape love, and a personal commitment to not resort to any form of violence, but to voluntarily suffer and sacrifice for the greater cause of saving our civilization. This is the power of nonviolence that's needed in our time. Nonviolence knocks the violator or perpetrator off balance, creating an internal wrestling with their conscience causing a hesitation to act. Nonviolence has the capacity, as we know, to turn an enemy into a friend. The power of nonviolence is that it has the capacity to bypass the emotions and make a direct appeal to the conscience of the perpetrator of injustice. At the same time, it has the capacity to awaken the conscience of those who are passive in their cooperation with evil and remain silent in the face of injustice and hum inhumanity, cajoling them to become allies in the cause. Nonviolence disarms the rationale for violence being used as a means to intimidate and suppress political or social action. Nonviolence has the power to disrupt the cycle of violence and dehumanization and redirect the energy of the conflict or injustice towards constructive means and constructive ends. In the end, nonviolence creates an avenue for dialogue instead of continued destruction so that a win-win pathway can be discovered. Ultimately, nonviolence has transformative power. At the King Center, we believe 
that nonviolence is a love-centered way of thinking, speaking, and acting that leads to personal, cultural, and societal transformation. In other words, nonviolence is an inside-out approach in that it comprises heart change as well as legislative and policy change. It often transforms those who are practitioners before it changes those who are perpetrators of injustice and ill will. And I close with these final words from my father when he delivered his message on a time to break silence. He said, we still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. This may well be mankind's last choice, chance to choose between chaos or community. 56 years later, these words still ring true. Perhaps we are the generation God has chosen to overcome the inclination towards chaos and to usher in a new dawning for all humanity, a world free from the ravages of poverty, racism, and militarism, a new age where economic security, interracial brother and sisterhood and world peace are the order of the day. This is the vision of the beloved community described in the dream of my father. And the only way we can bring it is through embracing the nonviolent philosophy and strategy. Jesus Christ showed us that peace is not just the goal. Peace is the way as well. So yes, today there is a choice to be made. Some choose the roar, roar, roar of the cannon, the blast of a bomb. Some choose the rolling drums of marching armies, and some even choose the pathway of nuclear armament, and still others choose the militaristic arming of police forces. But today, let us choose another way. Let's choose the way of unconditional love that we call nonviolence. Let's choose the song of peace, the anthem of justice, and join in the symphony of sharing and a caring community, which we call the beloved community, which is ultimately the kingdom of God. Thank you and God bless you.